Guys, uh, it is the start of another massive, I don't want to call it historic, Georgia NFL draft week because last year will be pretty hard to top. But when you look at uh, the opportunity Jalen Carter has, Broderick Jones, Darnell Washington, Nolan Smith in the first round, the dogs could make a lot of noise once again. And uh, some offensive Georgia players sneaking in there this time around because last year, of course, it was just a defensive barnstorming from all those dogs that made it in the first round. But how do y'all anticipate this year's draft will have a different flavor from uh, from last season's? Is it as simple as to say that there is more of an offensive presence? You know, really, when you look at Darnell Washington, obviously there was George Pickens last season. Uh, but right out of the gates, once again, you've got just a, a really good mix of dogs that made huge impacts on this national championship team that are going to get their NFL draft opportunity. Uh, for me, I, I think the big difference this year is the Jalen Carter thing. Um, it, that's the one that I think everybody's going to watch. And, and that's because we just don't know what's going to happen. And like, I mean, last year going into it, you thought, Trayvon Walker had a chance to be the, the number one overall pick. I think we had that story written and then it uh, got deleted or, or fell back into our admin. If everybody <laughs> will remember correctly on, the, on that evening. Um, but, you know, that was pretty well understood. You, you thought that he was going to go pretty high in that draft. We, I mean, we had first round stories written for a lot of those guys uh, pre-written with Jalen Carter uh, we, we're still going to have a first round story pre-written for Jalen Carter. But I think the question is, where does he land? Because it sounds like there's a potential for a slide, but is there really? And is that how much of that's just smoke that's out there? I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it feels like everybody in their power is trying to, uh, you know, suggest Jalen Carter doesn't love football. Jalen Carter has character concerns. You're, da, 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 da. And then you see some of these draft models and it's like, you know, you don't see it much below the eighth, seventh or eighth pick, right? Yeah. So it's it's a tough read, I think, this year in terms of where he's going to be selected. And is he going to be the first Georgia player off the board? I mean, the, these Nolan Smith projections continue to climb while the, the, yeah. the Carter things continue to fall. And I, I got to be honest with you, man. I Like I've said on this show, I hope the Falcons are the ones that are putting this stuff out about Jalen Carter. And I hope that he lands in Atlanta because he, I, that's a guy that the, the Falcons could absolutely use. I know Nolan Smith's been penciled into him a couple of times as well. Um, I think anybody would be happy to see a Georgia guy land with the Falcons uh, just because it's such a rarity. But overall, to me, that's the big storyline moving into Thursday is uh, how does Jalen Carter fare in this draft? Um, and, I don't think there's any reflection on Kirby Smart uh, and, and the culture of Georgia's program, but that's been the continuous narrative around that idea, right? No, that's that's absolutely the biggest storyline. I think the biggest difference between last year's group and this year's group is I think the second night could be pretty quiet. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, if, if Darnell Washington and Keely Ringo make it there, uh, which which I feel like most projections at this point – have that happening, they're going to hear their names called early, probably in that 40 to 50 range right there. And then Georgia may not have another guy picked until the fifth round. Um, you know, probably not going to end up with a third rounder. They could end up with a fourth. Uh, you know, I think that's an interesting round. Um, you know, I remember sitting at home last year as we were, uh, you know, getting ready to publish uh, all those stories and None of us would have expected Jake Camarda to go in the fourth. I, I didn't know Amir White to go in the fourth. Sure. Um, you know, that to me, that's kind of an area where. And I don't think anybody predicted Nicobe Dean to slide like he did. No, not, not to the third. Right. Um, you know, and, and personally, I didn't think James Cook would go in the second. So, no. yes, this, this draft can surprise you. And, and you know, maybe it's not going to be a quiet night. But, um, you know, I, I would say round two you're probably going to get one or two Georgia players, depending on if they go in the first, you know, Darnell more so than, than Keeley. Um, but I would be surprised if Georgia ends up with a, with a round three pick. And, and, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if they end up with a round four pick, but it, you know, it, it would come as a big surprise too. I think that the, the, what we saw last year with this group 
uh, of guys that Georgia had, the 15 that got picked, they were – it was almost equally distributed. They had no seventh-round picks. I mean, that was the nice part about, you know, sitting at home doing it all is at the end of the sixth – We were done. We were done. Yeah. We didn't have to watch the seventh round of the draft because all 15 of the Georgia players that were picked or were up for grabs were picked. Um <clears throat> First of all, I don't think that's going to be the case this year. They've got 13 available, and I would be absolutely shocked if all 13 of them got picked. Uh, and, and so, you know, that that's sixth round, seventh round. Things are going to get really interesting there because I do think that there's going to be a lot of dogs that start hearing their name called then as opposed to the earlier uh, rounds, you know, night the, the second night, rounds two and three. Yeah, and I don't I – don't... <clears throat> The only guy that really intrigues me as a possibility for that third round, and I, I don't think it's going to happen personally, but it's the other guy in the photo right yep, here. Stetson Austin Bennett. Jalen Carter. Yeah. It, it's Stetson Bennett. I mean, what's going to happen to Stetson Bennett? I talked about the Carter news and how that was the, you know, kind of the big flavor, I think. But the Stetson Bennett situation is going to be really interesting because I think the third round is as high as he will go. Right. Mm -hmm. But then there's then I mean, I think there's all the way to the possibility of undrafted free agent. I I, I mean, a, a seventh round pick is probably he'll probably get drafted. Stetson will probably some somebody will take a, a flyer. But the possibility exists, I think um, he that's a very intriguing one to watch uh, for on Thursday. So I, you know, I think it's on the table and I think it is like the widest gap yeah. between ceiling and floor yeah. in a draft uh, pick that I can remember. And I don't Brock really Purdy. cover the draft too closely. Haven't done that in quite a few years. Um, well, and, and the reasoning behind that is because the tape says one thing and the traits say another, the traits say, you know, the traits are all the reasons why he was a walk on coming into college. You know, he's not big. He doesn't have a great arm, this and that, and you, you know, but but the turn on the film and all you see is is him leading touchdown drives and him winning games and that speaks volumes to teams just as much as the measurables and, or lack thereof in in Stetson's case, um, you know, as as they do. Yeah, well, it's it's like what I said around Heisman time. Even though I was pretty confident he wasn't going to win, I did say, uh, and I wasn't just hedging my bets. It was just based on the experience of everything I'd seen him do. Nothing will surprise me with Stetson when it comes to something happening in his favor because of everything he did at Georgia. He won back-to-back -back national championships. He was a Heisman finalist. So if he goes high, gets picked high, it's not going to surprise me. If he doesn't get picked high, if he goes undrafted, but then also shows up in camp and a few months later we're, we're seeing him in a kind of a Taylor Heineke role where he's – found himself on the field because the starter got injured and he's balling out against these NFL studs, that's also not going to surprise me. So I can't wait to see from top to bottom what Stetson's NFL career looks like because I do think there's so much room for him to once again show people you're wrong about me. Yeah, but and I – no, I was going to say, I, I think one of the guys – you mentioned Taylor Heineke, and I'm glad you did because the, the guy who stands out to me – from last year is Brock Purdy, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about last pick in the draft, and the guy is about to possibly get a former like number three overall pick traded out of San Francisco because he's the presumed starter based on what he did on the field. And so I think that there's listen, quarterback uh, picking quarterbacks never been an exact science. I think everybody could agree to that, but you know, there's an open floor to some degree of who can play in this league and who can't Brack Purdy is not a guy who made it there on elite measurable. He's, he's not, you know, Josh Allen. He's not Will Levis. He's not running forties like uh, uh, Lamar Jackson. I mean, but he's won and he continues to win. And how does that affect Stetson? Uh, I, I'll be very intrigued to see that in the draft. The, the other, the other two guys that, you know, as we talk about, third round potential um <clears throat> the other two guys that i would throw in there would be kenny mcintosh and chris smith um you know just with, with with kenny it's interesting because you've got a really really deep running back class and that could both help him and hurt him uh you know it could help him in, in the fact that 
people feel like, you know, hey, once one one running back goes, there's going to be a run on them. Uh, but it could also hurt him because teams could, you know, instead of making that run on running backs, um, they, they, they might say, well, we can get a, you know, guy that we really believe in in the third or in the fourth or fifth or, you know, third day. Um, you know, and, and then with Chris, I mean, you know, just like Jalen was, we're talking about a unanimous All-American. And, and you know, on the flip side of things, uh, from from a deep running back class, it's not a deep safety class. So he if, could be, yeah. To me, he could be like the James Cook of this draft. Yeah, where, yeah, I yeah. could see that. I yeah. could see that. Like a late second round pick, early third. I mean, who would have had Channing Tindall? Um, you know, I guess Channing didn't go above uh, Nakobe, but but you know, being a a, a top three round pick, um, you know, I, I I think I think Chris has a chance to go there. What do yeah. you make of the uh, of the Nolan Smith rise? Because I'll tell you, it makes as far sense. as what he's done on the field, it would surprise me to see him go as high as some of these mocks that I've seen. Just I, in, in hindsight, I, I've seen one where he's as high as the 16th overall pick in the draft, 16, 17. I've seen some where he's 30th overall to the Eagles, which – I think would make a little bit more sense, but I mean, it's just shocking to me. And I guess when I look at him physically, what wouldn't surprise me is to learn that he just blew the doors off of everybody in the interview process because of how affable he is and the head he has on his shoulders, the leadership traits he has. And and you know that you have a known commodity there, but this rise, you know, kind of like ships in the night with Jalen Carter to an extent, not that they're actually passing each other, in the mocks, but uh, it's been something to watch the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I, and I think that really, like you said, to me, the thing that benefited Nolan more than anything was just getting in front of people. You know, everybody, everybody in our realm, I think to some degree had taken for granted who he was in terms of how that might impress and how that might boost his stock further. But then he goes to the combine, he blows the doors off of it. Like you say, uh, athletically, and then he has a chance to get in front of these people and speak and, uh, you know, to impart his message. And that's really been part of it all along. And, you know, Nolan Smith, I think, is if you're looking for a culture guy, that's the guy you're targeting. Um, he has all the elite measurables and he brings the personality and the want to and the leadership factor. And I think that that's as intriguing to people as you know look Jalen Carter was super productive I mean and, and is a, a force to be reckoned with but I think in a lot of people's cases it's how much and I'm not saying you got to babysit Jalen Carter but how much am I going to have to babysit a guy Nolan Smith has presented himself throughout this process throughout his career as a guy that you're not going to have to watch out for he's going to take care of himself Nolan's going to watch out for Nolan and he's going to make the right decision along the way well and <clears throat> and you know if you look at his college career, no one's going to watch out for everyone else that's yep. around him too. Yep. Um, you know, it, it, you know, listening to the talk about Jalen Carter, you know, you, you use the word babysitting. A lot of these people, a lot of these teams have, and, and, you know, mock draft analysts and people like that have said, well, you know, a, a team that's going to take Jalen Carter, they better have guys that can, you know, hold him accountable. Well, Nolan is one of those guys that, that can be a guy that holds, a player accountable down the road for you when you take him because, you know, go, go read the piece that I put up today. Um, you know, no one did an interview with on the NFL network earlier this past, or, you know, to start off the weekend. Um, and he talked about, you know, his experiences at Georgia and uh, you know, how he went from being the mentee under Aziz Ojolari to the mentor for Marvin Jones and, and, you know, what that was like. And, you know, I think it speaks volumes about Georgia's culture and Georgia's connection, but I think it also speaks volumes about Nolan and, and the kind of player that he is, uh, you know, being, you know, on the younger side of things, wanting to get better, wanting to get himself better and just soak up everything that somebody who's done it well before him has to offer, but then also wanting to share what he has. So, you know, learned and, and pass that along to others. So, oh, he you wants know, to be the I, next head coach of the Georgia Bulldogs. You know, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. 
And I saw, I forget whose it was. Um, so I won't even speculate. I think it was somebody from Yahoo, though, if I'm not mistaken, who had suggested the idea that the Bears traded around and basically paired Jalen Carter and Nolan Smith together and said, let, let him be kind of his brother's keeper here. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I saw that one at some point. And, and yeah. I, I want to say, I saw, baby. I, I saw one that had, Jalen slipping to 10 to the Eagles and then Nolan slipping to 30 to the Eagles where they would build Athens North. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, anywhere you go in the next decade, you could call a directional uh, tangent of Athens because there are so many dogs hitting the NFL draft right now. Um, I I can't wait to see what happens. We'll get into this more on Wednesday when Roe uh, joins us again, I'm sure there will be some more shuffling uh, among these crazy NFL mock drafts that uh, give us something else to talk about here. I'll tell you this. I, my, my, my last thing on this. I think Warren McClendon will outplay wherever he's drafted. I think Warren McClendon is a solid piece on an offensive line for years to come. I said that about Jamari Sawyer last year. You saw how the Falcons listened to me. Now he's the starting left tackle for the Chargers. Bang, bang, bomb. Be, be, what, uh, what I'm hearing is that you should be an NFL scout. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I I don't know if this is far fetched or not, but Roos, I think you keep up with the NFL as much, maybe maybe the most of any of us on the staff. Um, I keep it, so I keep up with the players. I don't. I just get I the vibe to... of that. I don't. Well, well I, I spend I a lot of time up, talking keep, no, about I keep it. Up with the players, and I, I watch the draft religiously. To be honest with you. I sort of ended up doing the recruiting stuff as a byproduct of the draft. I never like wrote about draft stuff, but I've always been obsessed with the draft and like the traits and the measurables and things like that. And so that naturally translated over to the high school recruiting aspect of things. And so I do. um, Yeah, I I absolutely look into that. And um, I follow this part of the year to me, the draft is the best part of the NFL. Oh yeah, it's so fun, man. I want to go to one. I've never been to one. No, me too. Me too. The uh, uh the, the one in Nashville looked to be a lot of fun down there on Broadway. Hope oh, Spring, ruined all those Hope bachelorette Spring. weekends. Yeah. Hope's Hope Springs anew every year. And I as a Falcon fan, I'm I, you know, I just set myself see, up man. once uh, once again for it, right? This could be the year. Yeah. Uh, 